welcome, Jeremy. Very excited for you to be here today. Could you give us a little background, kind of where you came from? I know you studied at Stanford. You've lived in Switzerland, and your initial studies were with the Ashaninka people of the Peruvian Amazon. But could you kind of tell us more about yourself? Yeah, well, everything you said was uh, correct, Christopher. I'm 62 now, so I was born in 1959 in Montreal in an English-speaking family, but in a French-speaking neighborhood. And I spent the first 10 years of my life uh, growing up uh, there. And then my parents moved to Switzerland, and we, we settled into a, another bilingual town, which is Fribourg, Freiburg. And that's where I went to high school. So I, I spent all my uh, youth living in bilingual places. Um, and I think that probably that the whole experience of being transplanted when I was 10 uh, made an anthropologist of me, or at least many people who end up doing anthropology um, have mixed cultural backgrounds. And so anthropologists go and study cultural differences out in the world, but they're also probably doing it to understand cultural differences inside themselves. Um, well, uh, after uh, high school in Switzerland, I studied history in, in England, and that led me to want to study anthropology. I was actually interested in social justice, you know, rich and poor, uh, third world development, and all of that. This was in the early 1980s. And it turned out that studying anthropology at Sanford was perfect for, for studying inequalities in the world, race, class, and gender inequalities. Um, and a professor uh, who heard me talk about my interest in third world development, which is what it, it was called at that point, um, said, you should study uh, a case where we have indigenous people on the one hand and development experts and development banks on the other. I hadn't even really thought much about indigenous people at this point, but he, he explained, these are people who live in out of the way places like the Amazon, uh, the Australian desert or the Arctic. They occupy vast natural resources, but they don't use them in ways that development experts consider rational. And so they're a kind of an Achilles heel in the whole development uh, scene. And so if you want to understand that scene, go and scratch at the Achilles heel. Go to a place where the World Bank is building a road into the rainforest and the indigenous people who live there have another point of view and study it. Study the two different points of view. Study the friction between indigenous people and capitalist development. In this case, it was one of the best places in the world to go and study such friction in 1983 or four was the Peruvian Amazon. And uh, it's exactly what was happening. The World Bank was financing uh, and other development banks like the Inter-American Development Bank were financing the construction of penetration roads into the jungle, which is what it was called taking lands away from indigenous people like the Ashaninka, right in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon, people who'd been living there for thousands of years and saying, well, these people don't know how to use their resources rationally. It's uh, economically justified to take their territories away from them. We'll cut the, the tree, we'll give the lands to people with a, individuals with a market mentality. They'll cut down the trees and establish cattle pastures. We'll call this development and uh, all is well. Uh, well, it, it was pretty clear at that time that all was not well. It was not even ecologically sustainable. Every time you cut down the rainforest and set up pastures, they leach and then become sterile savannas. And then you have to cut down more rainforest to establish more pastures, uh, let alone the human rights aspect of taking lands away from people who've been living there for a long time. So it was a... Uh, uh, this was a job for a young anthropologist with a political consciousness. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the work that I chose to do as a, a, a doctoral candidate in anthropology was frankly politically engaged. Uh, 
And there was no uh, pretense at being, let's say, uh, neutral or objective. At that point, uh, the anthropologist who taught me anthropology knew enough to know that no one could claim to have an objective point of view and that uh, the best you could do was situate yourself clearly and then say what you saw from that point of view. So, um, you know, there was no trouble being, frankly, on the side of Indigenous people. And the point was to try to understand uh, how they used the rainforest, how they thought about the rainforest, what their whole view was of the situation in which they were, where the rainforest in which they'd been living for a long time was being taken away and given to other people. Um, so that's how the kid from the suburbs of Canada and Switzerland ended up in the Peruvian Amazon at the age of 25 in the middle of the 1980s. And that was a transfer. I guess this is a pretty long answer to your question as to telling you a little bit about myself. But, you know, I'm a kind of an ordinary guy. Uh, but it's true that I think that I ended up uh, studying a fairly uh, interesting uh, situation. Uh, and it's, it hasn't become less pertinent. Let's just say the whole question of indigenous people, rainforests, cutting them down or not, just what is development? Um, uh, these continue to be uh, important questions uh, 35 or 40 years uh, later, I think. Um, but anyway, that, that experience of being on that front line at that point, of course, I wasn't alone. There were other anthropologists and other people doing similar things. Um, but uh, that really did um, change my understanding of myself as a white kid from the suburbs. And then it, it actually got complicated uh, after living a couple of years in the rainforest with Ashaninka people coming back to Europe and coming back to my world and not really recognizing it uh, that easily. It, it seemed there were many things that seemed a little bit odd about it. You know, when you've lived with people who make their clothes, grow their foods, harvest their medicines. I mean, these are very autonomous rainforest people. Uh, and then you go back to the world of shopping centers, everything's wrapped in plastic and you pay with money, um, and, and you think, ah, yes, and this is normality. Uh, this, this is what I used to consider normality. Um, you know, so the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss talked about this, you become a foreigner in your own land, um, but that's okay, that actually an anthropologist is a professional foreigner or a permanent outsider. So when you go to the Amazon, you're an outsider, but then you get transformed by that experience. And when you come back, you're still an outsider. But then that's your bread and butter is you have this outside gaze on, on things, you know? Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, I, I guess at the age of 30, uh, I settled into Switzerland where my family was. I'm still not a Swiss citizen to this day. Uh, I'm a foreigner. I'm a Canadian who lives in Switzerland. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's, it makes me a, a, an outsider. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I'm a foreigner wherever I go, except uh, Canada, but I hardly go there. Um, and um, I kind of like, uh, I kind of like it. Um, as in terms of being, let's just say somebody who tries to act in the world as a, an activist in favor of indigenous people, I raise funds and, and so forth. And I go between indigenous Amazonian people and foundations in Europe. And I've been arguing for the last 30 years in favor of uh, rainforest conservation via land rights for indigenous people. It turns out this, this too has been confirmed by scientific research that the, the best way to uh, protect a tropical rainforest is to entrust it to the indigenous people who've been living there for a long time. And that indigenous Amazonian territories are have, are denser in carbon than national parks. It's because they're looked after better. Anyway, so I've been a go-between as a, a professional activist for the last 30 years, and I also sometimes write books. And so that too is uh, an act where you say, okay, I'll take 
what everybody's said so far, what all the shamans I know have said, what all the intellectuals who have written the books have said or are saying right now, take, take it all, try to, b- belonging to no side or to no specific discipline, you know, in, in other words, uh, I don't respect barriers between disciplines. Um, and, but as an outsider, um, I allow myself to kind of swoop in and to, um, to make up my own mind, uh, which I think is the, the basic principle of an, of an essay. Um, you know, that's what an essay is. If you look at how Montaigne thought, thought of it, uh, he, he didn't necessarily talk about the outsider part, but it is definitely one individual trying to make sense of the world or at least a, a situation in the world. Um, and so I think that there's a, a strength in, in being an outsider like that, where you, you say, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't care how many doctorates the person has or, or whatever, I'll just take what they say and look at it and I'll make up my own mind. Um, so, um, yeah, that's kind of uh, a very long-winded answer to your question of uh, giving you a little bit more information as to who I am. But probably it's because... So I'm pluricultural, plurilingual, attached to no institution, uh, and I recognize no barriers between disciplines. So it's it's kind of like a, uh, you know, free electron or something. Uh, it's almost least, like be- beginner's mind or, you know, a fresh set of eyes when you uh, interact with the culture. Yeah, that's what I try to try to be and do. And and if it's talking with a biologist or if it's talking with an Amazonian person, it's it's all one song, really. In your latest book, Plant Teachers, uh, which you wrote with Indigenous elder Rafael Chinchari Pizuri, um, it's a cross-cultural dialogue that explores plant medicine and the similarities between ayahuasca and tobacco, the role of these plants in the indigenous cultures, and the hidden truths they reveal about nature. What is plant medicine and what are plant teachers? There are plants that have medicinal properties, and uh, this has been long recognized by even uh, allopathic medicine, uh, medical doctors, uh, historians. Uh, All cultures in the world have used plants for uh, to soothe as painkillers, uh, as anti-anxiolytic, uh, anti-anxiety agents. Uh, all, there's all kinds of, I mean, just think of uh, opium or morphine as in terms of uh, a painkiller. You know, no one would want to have surgery without having uh, painkillers. And uh, they come straight out of the, uh, uh, the opium poppy. So... Um, there's lots of examples in, in medicine when they actually do an, an, an operation on your uh, vital organs in your torso. They have to stop the heart from beating. And they do this with curare, which is a molecule that was developed by Amazonian hunters. Um, we, they've made a synthetic version of it, but until the 1940s, there was no way of uh, stopping a human heart from beating. And so uh, something that Amazonian hunters use to kill the monkeys that are hanging up out in, uh, up in the trees and that would otherwise die out of reach, they shoot this muscle paralyzing substance into them. And within three or four minutes, the monkey falls limp to the ground um, and they have hunted it. So it could be called a, a hunting poison at that point. But if you dose it correctly, it's fundamental to all major surgery, you know, so those are some pretty, and it comes from a a mixture of Amazonian plants. So plants contain these bioactive molecules and you, many different plants, many different bioactive compounds. And what is it? I think like 25% of all modern medicines originally come from a plant, like, you know, aspirin comes from willow, et cetera. So that's what a plant medicine is. I I, I suppose a plant medicine is when you haven't turned the willow into white aspirin pills, but it's still in the form of willow leaves. You boil it up and you have a plant medicine. 
whether aspirin itself qualifies as a plant medicine, I'm not sure. It's probably a, a pill, pill-shaped medicines inspired by plants. That's what uh, aspirin is. But anyway, so that's an idea as to just what a, 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 what a plant medicine is. A plant teacher, um, I think, is a frankly... Uh, Amazonian concept, even from the Peruvian Amazon. This is where you hear uh, originally about plant teachers. And this has been studied by botanists who have gone to the Peruvian Amazon. And uh, the last big study of this was in 2011 and spoken with indigenous people around the Peruvian Amazon. So there are 56 different tribes and cultures in that area, but also with uh, uh, mestizo people, people of mixed blood. And they all have this concept of uh, plants that teach, and uh, they've repertoried 55 different kinds of plant teachers. So there's the obvious tobacco, ayahuasca, coca, datura, brunf brunfelsia. Um, these are powerful psychoactive plants, but some plants that are considered powerful teachers um, are not hallucinogenic or psychoactive necessarily, like some of the big trees. Uh, these are uh, plants, that you, so you diet them. It means you take the, uh, uh, the, the bark from the tree, for example, you boil it in water, you make an extract, you drink this extract, and it will then influence your dreams. And so that's how the teaching of this, so it's not an, a hallucinogenic, it's, an, a, it's a dream-inducing plant. Uh, uh, an oniric agent, I think that one might say. Um, and so you pay attention to your dreams and in your dreams, you will receive information. That's how the teaching of some of these plants occurs. The basic idea is that you ingest a given plant and then it impacts on your body and on your mind in a way that you can pay attention to. And in so doing, you learn things about yourself and about the rest of the world. And uh, Amazonian people consider uh, the learning that occurs in, in such a case as being a teaching from the plant. Uh, a molecular reductionist might have another view, might just say, oh, well, that uh, teaching is simply the impact of the psychoactive molecules contained in those plants. And it's not that the plant is doing anything like teaching. It just happens to contain these molecules. And then they happen to impact on our body and on our brains in a certain way. And then we have these experiences uh, of modified consciousness or dreams or visions. And then we think the plant has been communicating, whereas in fact, it's all just the, simply the impact of their molecules on our brains and minds. It depends on your worldview. People are welcome to, to uh, so it's true that if you stick to that kind of um, uh, view, the concept of a plant teacher is a little bit too wild or, or animistic. Um, and uh, I'm not trying to force any kind of concept any, you know, that, uh, down anybody's throat. So you don't have to believe. In fact, I think that believing is the wrong category here. Um, it's, it's not about believing or not believing. Uh, it's actually, that's one of the things with these plant teachers. You take a plant like tobacco or, or like ayahuasca, um, it, you can uh, try it. In other words, uh, it's, you, it's not a question of believing whether this plant teaches or not. You can ingest it and then you can see what happens. And, and once you've seen what happens, if you wanna say, oh, that was nothing, but the impact of the molecules contained in the plant on my uh, serotonin receptors, you can go right ahead and say that. Um, but actually that's not what, <laughs> that's not what most people say. Uh, for example, those who, who drink ayahuasca, they tend to come back uh, saying quite the contrary, which doesn't prove that what they're saying is true. It's uh, uh, actually, ayahuasca gets people to, to entertain all kinds of ideas, not necessarily very solid ones. Um, you know, it, it generates uh, new ideas, hypotheses, images, possibilities. 
and they need taking with a grain of salt, but that's kind of a, another uh, question. But it's, it seems pretty true that plants like tobacco and ayahuasca are, uh, well, they're psychoactive. They make you uh, think in unusual ways. They generate connections that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Both of these plants are now studied uh, scientifically as uh, enhancers of cognition. You know, there's scientific research about either nicotine or ayahuasca as enhancers of cognition. Well, that's just a fancy way of saying plant teacher, really. I mean, you know, at least once you consider that these plants can enhance cognition, it becomes fairly easy to consider, to understand people who say, oh, yes, this is a plant teacher. Yes, when I eat it, it enhances my cognition. You delve deeply into the recent science of tobacco and ayahuasca, and you found considerable correspondences between the indigenous knowledge and contemporary science. Can you share some of these insights? Well, there's um, all manner of things. It's, it's true that the science of uh, tobacco is a lot deeper in time, let's say, than the, the science of ayahuasca. I think that one can say there's only really been serious scientific research on ayahuasca in the last 20 years, whereas tobacco has been studied for 200 years. There's a lot more that's known about tobacco uh, and its impact on the body and the brain than uh, about ayahuasca. I started doing the research for this book by talking with my co-author, uh, Rafael Chanchari, and so the, the horse that we put in front of the cart was indigenous knowledge about these two Amazonian plants. So we're going to start with what do indigenous Amazonian people say about tobacco? Well, they say a whole bunch of things about tobacco. It's the number one medicinal plant, the number one shamanic plant. Uh, among the Ashaninka with whom I, I lived, the word for shaman is sheri piari. It means the person who takes tobacco. It's, it's that important. Um, well, so Rafael Chanchari uh, uh, talks about tobacco as a, as a painkiller. Um, he also talks about tobacco as being something that um, strengthens the masculine and feminine hormones. So uh, there I was uh, in um, November 2018 listening to this uh, Amazonian uh, expert uh, tell me this thing, I thought, well, that's going to be fairly easy to verify because sometimes the shamans say things that are more difficult to verify because they use tobacco to talk with invisible entities and they say that the plant has a, a mother, so the mother of tobacco, but the mother of tobacco is actually a masculine presence and, and on and on. And it was pretty clear when I heard all that, that that was not going to be verifiable very quickly by science. But when he said that it strengthens masculine and feminine hormones, I'd never heard of uh, tobacco or nicotine having that effect. But uh, when I got back to my office here, it was one of the first things I looked up, uh, the impact of nicotine on testosterone and estrogen. And um, I, I, once again, I'd never heard of it, but it's confirmed. The, uh, it, it actually does ex just that. Um, and numerous studies uh, demonstrate it. It actually turns out that women are more susceptible to getting hooked by industrial cigarettes than men. There is um, uh, 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 an increased uh, sensibility of women via estrogen, no doubt, uh, for tobacco. They get more gratification out of it and they have a harder time stopping smoking or giving it up. So yes, the Amazonian shaman has one-to-one uh, -one knowledge about you. What he says about the impact of this plant is completely verified and to my surprise, on the scientific side. And so actually by listening to the indigenous voice on tobacco, um, 
I learned more about tobacco. I never even thought of looking at the impact of tobacco on uh, sex hormones. But once I did, I found that the research had been done and that it, it is confirmed. So uh, yes, reading the science of tobacco, uh, ha having been informed by the indigenous knowledge on the subject allows for all kinds of shortcuts and for, uh, well, understanding things clearly because they've been, let's just say, synthesizing their uh, uh, experience-based knowledge about the plant for a long time. So when they say it does this and that, uh, you're pretty sure that uh, in actuality it does. Whether science has been able to uh, demonstrate it yet is, is another question. The, uh, another example is that tobacco nicotine is a confirmed uh, painkiller or analgesic. And people around the Amazon, for example, when, when people have a wound that's painful, they apply tobacco, fresh tobacco leaves to the, to the wounds, like a, like a patch, really, like a nicotine patch. So, um, you know, these are the kinds of correspondences that one can find between uh, indigenous knowledge and science when it comes to these powerful medicinal plants. Can you briefly just touch on the Western understanding of tobacco or what we would probably refer to as industrial tobacco with additives and what the indigenous uh, use and their relationship with tobacco as a medicine and a healer? You know, yes, but probably not briefly. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's such a contorted subject. Um, I'll try to make it very brief. I'll make it telegraphic. That'll help. White man didn't like the powerful, dark, shamanic tobacco of indigenous people. It was too strong. It used to make their head spin. And so they selected it down to weak uh, Virginia style, blonde tobacco, 15 to 20 times less nicotine, just enough nicotine to tickle the neurons never a full delivery of, uh, well, the shamanic plant teacher. And then they turned it into industrial cigarettes at the beginning of the 20th century and laced this weakened plant teacher uh, with hundreds of chemicals that are uh, often uh, carcinogenic when they're combusted, which is what happens when you light a cigarette. Nicotine is not what gives you cancer. Uh, nicotine is not innocuous. Uh, it can actually increase your risk of uh, type two diabetes, but that's another question. What is so deadly, it would seem in industrial cigarettes uh, are the byproducts of combustion of all the different chemicals that are added in there. It also depends on how the tobacco is treated and how it's dried on its quantity of nitrosamines, and we go into some detail about, um, about that in the book. Um, so actually the toxicity of industrial cigarettes and tobacco products depends not just on the chemicals that are, that are put in there. There's also the fact that by weakening it down and turning it into a nicotine delivery device, which is how the uh, uh, tobacco industry spoke of their own products, in their internal communications. It's not just, just enough nicotine to tickle the neurons, but never actually uh, give a full uh, delivery. It's so that they light up the next one as soon as possible. And so what you're doing is, instead of having one big dose on a precise occasion with, for, with a precise reason, shaman style, where you take a, a very large dose of nicotine and tobacco, you're forever lighting up something that's laced with all, all these other chemicals. It means that you're constantly bombarding your lung cells with toxins. Um, cells normally divide, they, you know, uh, occasionally. They're, they're not always dividing, but cells sometimes divide. When uh, they are dividing and there's a bombardment of toxins, usually they stop the division process.
but some sometimes they're 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 so engaged in the division process the dna is uh, duplicating itself and at this point if there is a bombardment of toxins this causes mutations it breaks the dna so if you're forever smoking cigarettes 20 cigarettes a day you're constantly bombarding the problem is not just what's in the cigarette and that you're 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 using combustion the problem is that you're doing this on such a regular basis so the 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 these very uh deadly products finally i mean millions of people die every year because of smoking cigarettes we take this very powerful plant that is considered the number one plant teacher in the amazon it comes from the amazon it, in its natural form it has 15 to 20% nicotine in it this is very powerful you weaken it down and to turn it into very low nicotine it no longer teaches anything it's like an ex plant teacher and then you lace it with all these chemicals and you turn it into a chronic addiction because that's the whole point if you want to sell cigarettes we are a million miles away from the original and the original is what the original should be compared really to something like dynamite in other words it's a very powerful thing you never truly master shamanic tobacco you can try to avoid being mastered by it there's all kinds of uh, arrangements that you have to take if you're going to work with that plant which actually i i can tell you that i do not i do not work with tobacco but i respect it and i i try to inform people if you want to work with this plant then it's worth heeding the knowledge of indigenous amazonian people and unlearning what the cigarette industry and the film industry and Humphrey Bogart and everybody has taught us about how to smoke tobacco so that would be the uh, short answer to the question um you talk about the power of plant medicine of these substances like tobacco ayahuasca that are um used in shamanic practices can you speak to some of the dangers of those substances or things to be wary of um since most western seekers may or may not be familiar with it and we have a very different cultural context for these uh, substances well uh, first of all um i'll say a word about why the two plants are considered uh, next to each other at least in our book it's simply because uh, in the amazonian view of things these two plants are more or less inseparable in other words you, you they are the number 1 and number 2 plant teachers in terms of uh, uh, uh common usage in the western amazon at least people wouldn't dream of taking ayahuasca without tobacco so as they practice uh uh working with these two plants they often combine them um even though they are uh different plants um and have different personalities uh, as far as they're concerned i would say that just from a a chemical point of view because i'm all in favor of knowing about molecules um uh, tobacco is uh more dangerous more dangerous that that means that uh for example if you could extract the nicotine that is in a couple of cigarettes and turn it into a drop of pure nicotine and you put that drop on some, a person's skin or on their in on their tongue it would kill them by for by heart attack i think is uh, how how that works i mean nicotine is a poison plants tobacco plants produce it to to kill insects originally i mean the tobacco plants have been producing nicotine for millions of years long before humans uh showed up and decided to start smoking the stuff so there you can reach a lethal dose of tobacco fairly quickly and in fact in most of the cases where there have been reported ayahuasca deaths in fact it is because there was tobacco in the ayahuasca and that people like westerners who are tobacco naive in other words they've never consumed tobacco at all if you have never had tobacco in your life and suddenly you get a huge dose of tobacco or of nicotine you can die 
So um, when I was saying that uh, tobacco is like dynamite, uh, it's also because you have to be careful. Actually, you know, just handling fresh green tobacco leaves of uh, strong tobacco, it goes through your skin and, and you, you, you get your head starts spinning and makes you feel nause nauseous. I mean, it's a, it's a plant that can make your head spin just, just by touching its leaves. So that's tobacco. Ayahuasca, oddly enough, so this is a, a, a liana uh, that serves as the basis for a drink and then different psychoactive plants can be added to it. So it depends on which ayahuasca we're talking about. Does it only contain chacruna and therefore DMT, which is a hallucinogen, or does it contain uh, tobacco and nicotine or perhaps coca and cocaine or Brunfelsia and scopolamine. It's so it's it's a, a psychoactive cocktail, and depending on what you've put in it, it can be more or less uh, dangerous. Once again, drinking uh, ayahuasca with a lot of tobacco in it is a is a risky enterprise. But if you take just basic ayahuasca, the the liana itself, or and let's just say mixed with chacruna, which is which contains DMT, that kind of ayahuasca. It turns out it's, it's very difficult to consume a lethal dose of this. It's apparently 20, 20 times the effective dose is the lethal dose of that kind of ayahuasca. Whereas with uh, alcohol, it's 10 times the effective dose. So, you know, you take 10 glasses of wine and swallow them in quick succession, depending on your weight. Uh, this can cause you to fall into a coma and even to die. So they say that the lethal dose of alcohol is 10 times the effective dose. With ayahuasca, it's 20 times. Well, 20 times, drinking 20 effective doses of ayahuasca, this is something like two liters of ayahuasca. It, it's almost uh, in, an impossible feat. In other words, ayahuasca makes you vomit. It's a, it, it is a vomit, and it's, it's nauseous. So, you know, you drink the first dose down, try a second dose, my goodness. After the third dose, you know, even if you wanted to drink 20 doses, you probably couldn't hold them down. In other words, it's very difficult to die simply from ayahuasca. That's, it's actually what's deceptive about ayahuasca because it's very powerful. It can propel you into uh, unimagined uh, mental realms or visionary realms or other realms, whatever. Uh, and then the next day you come back and you're back more or less back to normal. It's, it's fairly innocuous for the body. It actually cleans you. If it's good ayahuasca, it tends to strengthen you. It's good for the immune system. It does all kinds of things. It helps create new neurons. It's a, it, it has health benefits. So, uh, but ayahuasca does have uh, dangers there, uh, I think, at another level. It, they have a whole kind of delirious view of things. This occasionally happens with ayahuasca and other hallucinogens. It is invariably temporary. People often don't know how to handle it because it's not really part of our culture. It's an understudied phenomenon. It's fairly rare. What is less rare, and this is other people have, have talked about this, uh, Luis Eduardo Luna, the anthropologist said, the biggest danger of ayahuasca is ego inflation. And, and this is something, it's a, it's a funny thing because ayahuasca and other hallucinogens like LSD, psilocybin and so on, uh, people who use them report ego dissolution. Uh, that's part of uh, the experience. But then what can also be part of the experience is that the, when the ego comes back, it comes back in spades. And, and once again, this is a minority of people who, who have this experience, but then suddenly after ayahuasca, suddenly they think that they're gonna become the shaman to heal the world, or they're gonna go and do this, that, and the other. And uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, it does have messianic uh, tendencies that one has to learn to uh, control.
So there's all kinds of things that actually one has to learn to, uh, if one is going to work with ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is like a wild horse. In other words, what are the dangers of a wild horse? Well, it can kick you in the teeth. Uh, it can throw you into the bushes when you thought that you were controlling it. It can take you for a wild ride. And it's not necessarily something that's very easy to integrate into a, a Western lifestyle, let's say. And I think that some people have, have run into this problem. So these are some of the, the dangers of, of ayahuasca is that it, it can be very um, seducing. And you think, oh my goodness, there's a whole realm and I learn so much. I see so many things and it makes me think about so many new things and it inspires me and, uh, on different levels. It does seem to enhance creativity. Uh, so if you're a musician, or, or actually some people discover be, that they are musicians. Some people s just go and start playing the piano and they've never played the piano before. Or they start painting or sculpting. Ayahuasca has a tendency to do that to people or else they start writing books about ayahuasca or they make films about ayahuasca or they become shamans and, you know, they transform themselves and they get inspired uh, that way. That can be positive and constructive, but it can also uh, mislead people. And um, I talked this over uh, with uh, Rafael Chanchari, my, my co-author, and, and put it to him uh, straight up. So, does ayahuasca mislead people? Because I've seen a lot of people myself, especially gringos, getting misled by it. He said, no, ayahuasca doesn't mislead people. It's people who mislead themselves. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, so then um, uh, tell me more. How does this work? Is it about that people are projecting uh, things rather than having true visions? Yes, that's it. And one has to learn the difference. Okay, well, fine. So how do you learn the difference between what you, what you are projecting through your ayahuasca experience and what the plant is truly teaching you? He said, oh, well, uh, that just takes practice. So it means that for years, before rushing to any conclusions, you need to have experiences. That, that's one of the, I think, one of the problems now with Westerners who use ayahuasca is they, they take it a few times. They think it's fantastic. And they take, uh, they take it all without a grain of salt. They haven't learned to tell the difference between projection and true vision. They haven't had enough time practicing, you know, and they've rushed into concluding that they know what they're up to. I mean, I certainly wish that they are, that they do know what they're up to, but, um, you know, sometimes they, they don't. And, and what is required, I think, is more modesty, more prudence, more time, you know, the, the knowledge that you don't, nobody becomes a, a, a powerful shaman in, in two years. That's rubbish. You know, it takes at least 20, even 30. The, the Yagua people in the Peruvian Amazon say, you don't trust ayahuasqueros until they have lines in their face. You know, these young ayahuasqueros, you got you to gotta watch out. Their skin is too um, smooth. <laughs> In your writings, you've said that uh, shamanism is a dialogue with nature. And you've also referred to that the shaman song uh, was a way that shamans communicate with nature. How important is music or singing when connecting with nature for shamans that work in the Peruvian rainforest? Well, um, other anthropologists have uh, said the same, first of all, a uh, guy like uh, Gerardo Reichel Dolmatov, who, who studied the use of yaje ayahuasca in indigenous Colombia in the 1960s and 70s, said that for indigenous Colombians, ayahuasca was a means for nature to um, have its complaints heard. And so when plants or animals felt that humans were treating them badly, hunting them in a way that caused too much pain, uh, over hunting, so th these kinds of uh, complaints, that uh, in the ayahuasca visions of, uh, uh, indigenous, of, of humans who take ayahuasca, that's when uh, nature can have its uh, complaints heard. And so 
Yes, there is this vision among different indigenous people in uh, the Amazon that they don't even have the concept of nature, nature being what is separate from humans. They actually think that plants and animals are people like us. Well, what does this mean exactly? Philosophers have talked about just what is a person. There's a book called Plants as Persons that, uh, that discusses the, this by Matthew Hall. Finally, it's not that they think that there's a little human being inside each blade of grass and inside each uh, deer and each squirrel. It's more that each living being, plant or animal, has a point of view, or it's like there's someone home, quite simply. Someone just like you and me, finally. What do they want to do? Well, they're, they're built like us. They're biological beings like us. They want to survive. They want to uh, eat. They want to reproduce. They want to thrive. And uh, they don't look like us, but deep down, and that's what the indigenous Amazonians say. You drink ayahuasca, you eat tobacco, and then you see the person inside the plants and the animals. And anthropologists have, have defined this. When, when, once you're in a culture where people are referring to plants and animals as persons, then you're in the realm of uh, shamanism. And, and that's what shamanism is. It's a kind of a conversation with all the living beings around us, not just uh, all the non-humans. And recognizing the kinship that we have with them and identifying with them sufficiently to recognize that they have a point of view and that it's actually that one can use one's uh, empathy and one's imagination and one's psychoactivated mind to imagine what the blade of grass's point of view is or what the, the deer's point of view is. You know, it's not a, a, a anthropomorphism. It's simply using what we as humans have at our disposal to try to understand the beings around us with whom we really do have kinship. I mean, science has truly demonstrated that the DNA sequences in my body uh, connect all the way back to the DNA sequences of a bacterium four billion years ago. And th that's a true statement for every living and dead organism uh, on this planet. You know, it's a, all one family. And this kind of this Western idea that uh, us humans are the only ones who have minds, the only ones who have subjecthood and, and rights, and that all the others are kind of uh, machines or mechanisms that are just there for us to uh, exploit. I mean, this is a, a truly unusual point of view in terms of what people in this world have, have uh, thought. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a European people divorce themselves from all the other creatures and species about 500 years ago. And, and that's what made science possible. It was by objectifying all of nature that, and taking a distance from it that we could then study it. And that's what science is. It's studying nature as if it were a bunch of objects. That's been the, the, the method and the approach, and it's been a very powerful one. But it's also led us to this position where we have a hard time understanding our place in, in, in the world. And then we see these cultures, like the Amazonian cultures, and we say, oh my, this is interesting. They, uh, oh, it seems that they have a dialogue with nature and it's called shamanism. And, uh, oh, they recognize the person inside plants and animals. You know, it, it makes them sound like they're superstitious, childish uh, uh, animists. In fact, they never did get contaminated with the idea that plants and animals are just objects. And they know full well that they are also sentient beings that perceive, learn, remember, communicate, just like we do. Except they just don't do it in English like, like we're doing right now. 
you can probably see when I answer, I go back and forth between what the shamans say and what the uh, scientists say and, uh, and so forth. Actually, where the shamans are very clear uh, is here about music. And on the scientific side, for the moment, the, the science, I don't think, is caught up. So there is not equivalence of concepts. And that, too, is interesting and needs pointing out. So what do the shamans say? That inside all living beings, there are invisible entities that are persons or like a personality or like an energy. And each species has this essence or owner or mother. They use different words. So the tobacco plant, for example, has a mother or an owner or an essence. So what is this entity like? Well, when you, if you take ayahuasca or tobacco, you can see in your visions this entity. Fine. So, and what is this entity like? Well, it takes different forms, but it emits a melody. And finally, we're talking about all different living species have an essence, and the essence of this essence is a melody. This is the shamanic point of view. So what does the shaman do? Pay attention in his or her visions to this entity, listen to that melody, and sing along with it. And you learn the melody of different species, so you learn the melody of tobacco, and that can allow you to summon the essence of tobacco the next time you want to. But they also say that when you sing along with one of these entities that you've perceived and you are singing this powerful being's melody, you learn to see things from the point of view of that powerful being. And that's where the knowledge comes in. And so an anthropologist uh, called Jean-Pierre Chaumet has written a book. In, it's called To See, To Know, To Have Power. Voir, Savoir, Pouvoir. And this is the, the, the three steps of the uh, ayahuasca shaman among Yagua people in the Peruvian Amazon. First, you see. He, I, he omitted to say you listen. And then you sing along. And then you know, because you can see, as you sing along with them, you see from their point of view, and that gives you knowledge. And that knowledge, having seen from their point of view, gives you power. And power is a double-edged sword. And then you bring this Actually, this is one of the difficulties of shamans, is that you leave human society, you go into this other realm where there are these powerful entities, you see from their point of view, and that almost makes you predatory when you come back to the human community. You have to kind of de-jaguar yourself when you come back from having had that uh, uh, exchange with these powerful entities. Meanwhile, what you bring back, you cannot bring back hallucinations. We don't uh, emit hallucinations. What we do emit, we can emit, omit, no, emit is sound. We can sing. So we can, and this is the one thing that we have in common with these entities. So the essence of the essence is a melody. We can learn it and we can sing it and we could sing it back to them. And it would seem that they actually like this. So this is the medium of communication that humans have with these non-human entities or powerful beings that shamans perceive inside all living beings. And so that makes music the, the key uh, modality uh, for uh, knowledge, really. A, an anthropologist called Peter Gao has written an interesting book called An Amazonian Myth and Its History. And it deals at length with the uh, shamanism of uh, Piro people. And he, he looks into just the, the exact role of these songs and shaman songs called Icaros and how, how people think of them. And his conclusion is that uh, for, from the Piro point of view, and the Piro are neighbors of the Ashaninka people I was living with, they have very similar 
notions, the Piro people consider that these songs, or, or rather that these powerful beings, these essences, they are made of knowledge and they are songs. So that the essence of the essence is a song and that once you know this song, it gives you knowledge. So the powerful beings that are invisible, but that are animating all the living beings in the world from the shaman's point of view, these beings are made of knowledge and they are songs. And then, so it's up to the shaman to learn these songs. And uh, as has been pointed out, uh, just like university professors will say, oh, I've already published 30 books in university presses. And you think, oh my, what a, what a career. The shaman will say, oh, I already know 80 ikaros of 80 different species. You say, uh -huh. In other words, uh, that's how you know how knowledgeable a, a shaman is, is how many uh, ikaros they have learned. And not by picking them up from other people, but by true exchange in the realm of visions. Anyway, that would be a, the short answer to your question. Yeah, that's really just a lovely explanation. Rational science has proven to be a powerful way of knowing, yet it excludes other ways of knowing, such as indigenous wisdom, mysticism, religion, and others. Can science be complemented by some of these insights, and how can that help our awareness of ourselves in the world we live in? I think, uh, actually, this is what our, our little book uh, on tobacco and ayahuasca tries to show, is that you can take science seriously, or you, in fact, you gain from taking science seriously, especially if you want to understand plants like tobacco and ayahuasca. But um, actually, complementing science with... Uh, 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 another point of view, such as the point of view of uh, 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 Amazonian expertise, leads to a richer understanding. But this is what readers can, can decide. I think it really depends on where you stand. My point of view is that I, I want to know both. I want to know what the shamans say. I want to know what the scientists say. And then I want to make up my own mind, combining what I think is pertinent. And Actually, I, I think that uh, so far, uh, uh, at least when it comes to uh, these two plants, uh, the uh, two systems of knowledge are, are perfectly complementary. And that scientists would be ill-advised to think that they have the monopoly on knowledge. And so therefore, they're going to disregard what anybody else says and disregard anybody who doesn't follow their, their methods. But... I think that real science or true science has always been open to the unknown, open to the fact that science doesn't control everything and open to the idea that people who don't necessarily have a lab and don't, haven't been to university can actually have astonishing knowledge about uh, plant properties and, and, and many things. I mean, all the great discoveries of humanity, like just simply agriculture, were, were created by people who <laughs> had never set foot in a university. And in fact, who were, lived much closer to, in terms of uh, livelihoods, to the people in the Amazon right now. So, you know, our ancestors were a smart bunch of people. And, and discounting human knowledge and saying the only knowledge that counts is uh, scientific you know, I think it's a bit ridiculous and, and a, a bit uh, outdated. But yeah, probably uh, it's going to be an effort for scientists to learn to listen, open up a space where other points of view may be um, interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll just take a, a, a short example. Scientists working on nicotine addiction, they, you know, they want to sort of warn people, cigarettes are dangerous, nicotine is bad for you, etc. Okay, fine. Well, if, if they worked with tobacco shamans and people who, who know the plant, they, they, they say, look, the mother of tobacco is, is she's a, a, a fearsome entity. You want to be careful when you deal. And so it's as if the plant has a personality. 
and it's a powerful one. And you need to have know-how and you need to have a little bit of fear in you when you're dealing with this entity. Talking about tobacco as if the, the plant has a personality allows human beings to put a face on the danger that the plant represents. If all you say is, oh, it contains a molecule and this molecule is bad for you, you know, that's a discourse that only goes so far with, with human beings. Um, in other words, personifying the plant uh, can be a useful complement to objectifying it. And it takes nothing away from objectifying the plant that yes, it does contain nicotine and we want to know the percentage. We want to know everything that the plant contains and just what the smoke contains when we burn it. We want to know all of that stuff. But adding to that knowledge, for example, a personification of the plant might actually simply be a good idea in terms of public health and to get people to understand what they're doing when they're, when they're actually interacting with uh, this plant, even if it's in the form of uh, uh, industrial cigarettes, or even especially if it's in the form of industrial cigarettes. Um, you know, so that's where I think that uh, it's fairly obvious that um, uh, science gains from being complemented with other approaches. I think it's also true that simply if you're a practicing scientist, you know, going outside the box and actually uh, taking seriously what shamans say about certain plants, it can be a great source of new ideas, new hypotheses. Um, you know, what's wrong with it? It, it? You don't have to believe it or even disbelieve it. It's not about belief. It's not about religion, in fact. It's it's something that you can that you can test. Uh, it's something that can have efficacy or that can impact on our way of knowing. So there there are ways of uh, being a Western scientist and working with people who are in a, another system of knowledge and collaborating and and learning together and doing research together. And I think that that's actually what's going to be at hand in a lot of places in, in the years to come. That this idea that, that science is divorced from the world and from all the different human cultures and that it's the, it has to stick in, in, into it, in its ivory tower, I think is, it's kind of finished, really. You know, there's just too many important things that are going on. We need to understand rainforests. There's so many things that are... That are um, urgent and that need attending to, and they have to be attended to by, you know, all the talent we have on deck and uh, collaborating, please.